Chapter Two of The Tower of London by Arthur Poyser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two Historical Sketch Part Two two years after the suppression of this uprising in the north a smouldering yorkist insurrection in the west was stamped out by the usual method of securing the leaders in this case henry courtenay marquis of exeter sir edward neville and sir nicholas carew and taking off their heads on tower hill others were seized about this time accused of being implicated in certain traitorous correspondence and were also brought to the tower amongst them were lord montague and sir geoffrey pole with their mother the countess of salisbury sir adrian fortescue sir thomas dingley and the marchioness of exeter as regards the aged countess of salisbury in a contemporary document it is said that she maketh great moan for that she wanteth necessary apparel both for change and also to keep her warm in a history dealing with the period by lord herbert of cherbury we have a description of the countess's last moments which were tragic enough even for tower records on may twenty eighth fifteen forty one the old lady was brought to the scaffold set up in the tower on tower green and was commanded to lay her head on the block but she as a person of great quality assured me refused saying i am no traitor neither would it serve that the executioner told her it was the fashion so turning her grey head every way she bid him if he would have her head to cut it off as he could so that he was constrained to fetch it off slovenly however freud discredits this story and it certainly seems to be almost too fantastic to be true still the fact remains that the countess was subjected to unnecessarily harsh treatment while in the tower for the reason it is said that the king hoped she might die under the privations and so save him bringing her to the block to thomas cromwell the instigator of the terrible punishments that were meted out to those concerned in the risings fate had already brought retribution in fifteen forty he had been created earl of essex a few months afterwards his fall came on a day of july of that year he too came to the tower and suffered the death on tower green that he had prescribed for others the tower was becoming like some mighty monster whose craving for human blood was hard to satisfy accuser and accused yeoman and earl youth and age innocence and guilt seemed to come alike into its greedy maw cromwell was taken from the house of lords to the tower and the angry king would listen to no word in his favour whatever his crimes as tyrant counsellor to henry two things may be reckoned to his credit for no man is altogether bad the bible was printed in english in fifteen thirty eight at his wish and he initiated a system of keeping parish registers at the time of cromwell's death the tower was inconveniently full of protestant heretics three of whom were got rid of by the simple expedient of burning them in smithfield while an equal number of catholics who were prepared to deny the king's supremacy in matters ecclesiastical went with them the king had not been too busy with ridding himself of enemies or supposed enemies to neglect other things he had married and divorced anne of cleves and had taken catherine howard to be his queen but her fate was not long delayed and another royal head was brought to the axe on tower green before her death she had asked that the block might be brought to her cell in order that she might learn how to lay her head upon it and this strange request was granted lady rochford the queen's companion was executed on the green after her mistress had suffered an eye-witness of the executions has left it on record that both victims made the most godly and christian end that ever was heard tell of i think since the world's creation catherine howard was only twenty-two years old when the tower claimed her life many of her relatives were imprisoned at the same time among them being her grandmother the duchess of norfolk the countess of bridgewater lord and lady william howard and thomas duke of norfolk it is rather startling to find that a prisoner in the tower could die for joy upon hearing that the charge brought against him was not proven this singular death released the troubled soul of viscount lyle from the walls of his dungeon and from the trials of this mortal life in the year that queen catherine was brought to the green
from execution we turn to torture anne askew an ardent believer in the reformed faith was cast into the tower for denying the doctrine of transubstantiation in an account of her sufferings by lord de ross we are told that the unhappy lady was carried to a dungeon and laid on the rack in the presence of the lieutenant of the tower and chancellor rosley but when she endured the torture without opening her lips in reply to the chancellor's questions he became furious and seizing the wheel himself strained it with all his force till knivet the lieutenant revolting at such cruelty insisted on her release from the dreadful machine it was but just in time to save her life for she had twice swooned and her limbs had been so stretched and her joints so injured that she was never again able to walk she was shortly afterwards carried to smithfield and there burnt to ashes together with three other persons for the same cause in the presence of the duke of norfolk the earl of bedford sir thomas rosley the lord mayor and a vast concourse of people religious bigotry alas is still with us but men have saner notions to-day as to the value of mere religious opinions and poor anne had the misfortune to live in a ruder age than ours but her sufferings are not forgotten religious tyranny has lost the power to send to the rack and the stake and to her and all who suffered be due honour given once more the curtain falls on tragedy and on its rise we see the tower decked out for revelry in fifteen forty six a great banquet was given in honour of the peace between france and england and the french high admiral the bishop of evreux and others came on embassy to england and were welcomed amid much rejoicing to the feast for a space the tower remembered there was laughter in life as well as tears however it rejoiced with difficulty and very soon had returned to gloomy dignity and sadness on paltry evidence the duke of norfolk who had led to victory at flodden field and was now seventy-four years of age was with the earl of surrey imprisoned in the tower surrey tried by jury in january fifteen forty seven on the nineteenth of the month was led out of the tower gate to execution on tower hill thus was sent to death england's first writer of blank verse and one of her most excellent poets surrey's instinct for prosody was phenomenal says mr edmund gosse and he at once transplanted blank verse from a soil in which it could never flourish it had recently been invented in italy to one in which it would take root and spread in full luxuriance yet the sweet singer who lit the torch that was handed on to shakespeare was brought to the block with the tyrant and the malefactor norfolk would have shared a like fate had not the king himself died a few hours before the time appointed for the duke's removal to tower hill he was set free when mary came to reign and died in his own home in fifteen fifty four at the good old age of eighty one young edward the sixth was brought up to the tower with great ceremony and began his reign when but a boy of ten in the tower he was made a knight and rejoicings in anticipation of his coronation made the old walls ring again to gladness the state procession from the tower to the abbey was conceived and carried through in a spirit of regal magnificence and from east cheap to westminster the streets were bedecked in a manner expressive of the joy of the people that henry's reign of terror had ended the boy king had not long been on the throne when under the guidance of protector somerset in whose hands was all the power of an actual ruler bloodshed began afresh thomas lord seymour brother of somerset and uncle of the king was immured in the tower and accused of ambitious practices beheaded on tower hill on march twenty fifteen forty nine this act brought down the rage of the populace upon somerset who was already unpopular by reason of his seizure of church property by his ill-gotten gains he had built the magnificent somerset house and in order to clear the ground for it he had demolished a church and scattered the human remains found there an act of desecration that the citizens regarded as a crime the earl of warwick headed the opposition seized the tower and the protector was lodged in the beecham tower later however he was pardoned and the young king records in his diary that my lord somerset was delivered of his bonds and came to court 
but the feud soon came to a head again and in fifteen fifty one somerset was shut up in the tower once more and his wife with him on a charge of high treason he was taken by water to his trial at westminster hall where he was acquitted of high treason but condemned of treason felonious and adjudged to be hanged the king who appears to have written a full account of events in his diary notes that he departed without the axe of the tower the people knowing not the matter shrieked half a dozen times so loud that from the hall door it was heard at charing cross plainly and rumours went that he was quit of all but far from being quit of all he was conveyed back to the tower and while some maintained that he was to be set at liberty others with equal heat asserted that he was to die speedily the dispute was set at rest by his execution on tower hill at eight of the clock in the morning the boy edward seems to have had some of the callousness of his father in his nature for he signed the death warrants of both his uncles with calmness and in his commentary on their executions he betrays no emotion whatever taking it all as a very commonplace happening the duke of somerset had his head cut off upon tower hill is the entry in the royal manuscript book at the time of the protector's committal to the tower there came with him as prisoners his supporters the earl of arundel lords grey and paget also sir thomas arundel sir ralph vane sir miles partridge and sir michael stanhope these latter being executed edward's short reign of six years had seen as many noble lives sacrificed as any six years of his father's reign had seen and with the queen who succeeded him the tale of bloodshed was not less full of sudden tragedy mary tudor was preceded by the nine days queen lady jane grey who had been named his successor by the dying edward at the instigation of the duke of northumberland lady jane had been wedded to northumberland's fourth son lord guilford dudley she was only sixteen years old she began and ended her reign in the tower to which she was conveyed by her father-in-law who was keeping edward's death secret until his plans were complete but mary had been proclaimed without the tower if lady jane had been proclaimed within the weaker was pitted against the stronger and northumberland whom we hear of at cambridge trying to go over to the side of the stronger by shouting god save queen mary in the public highway was arrested in spite of his proper sentiments and was brought prisoner to london and lodged within the tower where only a few weeks before he had been in command he suffered on august twenty second in the september sunshine lady jane was allowed to walk in the garden attached to the lieutenant's house and on the hill and to look out upon the river and the roofs of the city from the walk behind the battlements which connects the beecham and bell towers in the beecham her husband was held in bondage and there he carved the word jane on the wall where it is to be seen to this day in october mary was crowned and in november a sad procession wended its way up tower hill through tower street and eastcheap to the guildhall at the head walked the chief warder carrying the axe following came archbishop cramner lord guilford dudley and lady jane grey at their trial they pleaded guilty to high treason were sentenced and returned to the tower the warder's axe showing by the direction in which the blade pointed what their doom was to be to her father lady jane wrote from her prison-house my dear father if i may without offence rejoice in my own mishaps herein i may account myself blessed that washing my hands with the innocence of my fact my guiltless blood may cry before the lord mercy to the innocent i have opened unto you the state wherein i presently stand my death at hand although to you perhaps it may seem woeful yet to me there is nothing that can be more welcome than from this veil of misery to aspire and that having thrown off all joy and pleasure with christ my saviour in whose steadfast faith if it may be lawful for the daughter so to write to her father the lord that hath hitherto strengthened you so continue to keep you that at the last we may meet in heaven with the father son and holy ghost i am your most obedient daughter till death jane dudley
it is possible that queen mary might have spared the life of this sweet and gentle maid happier in her books and her devotions than in the intrigues of state but a rising of the men of kent under wyatt who demanded the custody of the tower and the queen within it brought matters to a crisis wyatt appeared on the southwark bank of the thames and was fired upon from tower walls this is the last time in its annals that the fortress was attacked and that it was called upon to repel an enemy wyatt captured at temple bar after a night march from kenston where he had crossed the river was soon in the tower and with him was led many a noble prisoner all hope that lady jane would be spared had now gone her father was seized and brought to the tower on february ten her husband was seen by her on his way to death on tower hill on the morning of the twelfth and she looked out again upon his headless body as it was brought back on a litter very soon afterwards and taken to the chapel a contemporary chronicle describes the preparations made for her own death on that day there was a scaffold made upon the green over against the white tower for the said lady jane to die upon she was led forth from her prison to the green by sir john bridges then lieutenant and mounted the scaffold with firm step the hangman offered to help her to take off her gown she desired him to let her alone turning towards her two gentlewomen who helped her off therewith giving to her a fair handkerchief to knit about her eyes then she said i pray you dispatch me quickly she tied the kerchief around her eyes then feeling for the block said what shall i do where is it one of the standers by guiding her thereunto she laid her head down upon the block and stretched forth her body and said lord into thy hands i commend my spirit and so she ended fuller has said of this noble girl she had the birth of a princess the life of a saint yet the death of a malefactor for her parents offences and she was longer a captive than a queen in the tower her father and wyatt before many days had passed were both beheaded on tower hill many luckless ones who had taken part in the kentish rising were put to death with every form of cruelty and shortly after these terrible days of bloodshed in london mary was married to philip of spain at winchester princess elizabeth had meanwhile been brought to the tower in custody and was landed on palm sunday at traitor's gate she was closely guarded but was allowed to walk on the open passageway where lady jane grey had paced up and down before her which is now known as queen elizabeth's walk towards the middle of may being set free of the tower she is said to have taken a meal in the london tavern at the corner of mark lane and fenchurch street on her way to woodstock the pewter meat dish and cover which she used are still preserved the city churches rang joyous peals when it was known she was out of tower walls and to those churches that gave her welcome she presented silken bell ropes when queen of england queen mary's days were darkened again by busy work for the headsman and by religious persecution thomas second son of lord stafford defeated in an attempt to capture scarborough castle was brought to the block on tower hill and a large band of prisoners was put in tower dungeons to make room for these many of the captives already there were released mary died on november seventeenth fifteen fifty eight and then began to dawn those spacious times of great elizabeth when england moved to greater glory than she had ever known before queen elizabeth on her accession came again to the tower spending the time until the coronation within its walls but she had too many memories of captivity there to retain much love for the prison which had now become her palace seated in a golden chariot the new queen ablaze with jewels passed on her way to westminster through a city decked out in all manner of magnificence and through a crowd shouting themselves hoarse with delight at her coming the tower appears in the records of elizabeth's reign almost wholly as a state prison an attempt was made to smooth out religious difficulties by committing a number of church dignitaries to its keeping among them the archbishop of york and finkingham abbot of westminster then came lady catherine grey lady jane's sister who had offended the queen by marrying lord hereford in secret 
her husband also was soon afterwards a prisoner he lay for over nine years in his cell but was released at the end of that time while lady hereford died in the tower the countess of lennox was imprisoned three times within the walls not for any treason but for love matters thomas howard son of the first duke of norfolk was shut up here for falling in love with the countess and died in captivity it is interesting to find that cupid could forge tower shackles as well as make a wedding ring and that to enter his service without the queen's permission was almost a capital offence in fifteen sixty two a suspected conspiracy to set the queen of scots ill-fated mary on the english throne was the cause of arthur and edmund de la pole great-grandchildren of the murdered duke of clarence being put into the beecham tower where when we reach that portion of the building on our rounds we shall see their inscriptions on the walls the brothers were fated never to leave their place of confinement alive after fourteen years of respite tower hill again claimed a victim the duke of norfolk suffering there in june fifteen seventy nine in the following year roman catholic prisoners were brought one might say in droves to tower cells many of them were subjected to torture either by the rack the scavenger's daughter the thumbscrew or the boot in fifteen eighty one father campion a jesuit was hurried to death and in fifteen eighty three we hear of one captive committing suicide in order to escape the awful fate of dismemberment that many of his fellow prisoners had suffered it seems as if the sanity of life the sweet wholesomeness we associate with the merry england of shakespeare's time had not pierced the solid crust of tower tradition to lay down a comedy of the great dramatist and take up contemporary records of the tower is as if one had stepped out of the warm sunshine and fragrant air of mid-june into a dark damp vault whose atmosphere stings with the chill of a november night tower dungeons were becoming too crowded many a poor obscure captive was sent over to france perhaps to a harder lot and the vacant places were filled by political offenders northumberland killed himself in the tower arundel made prisoner with him died from self-imposed privations it is said some months after sir john perrot lord deputy of ireland was charged with using some hasty words against the queen and that was considered sufficiently dire an offence for lord chancellor hatton to have him brought to the tower but elizabeth refused to sign the warrant for his execution he died in his captivity after six months of a broken heart of the imprisonment of raleigh and of robert devereux earl of essex something will be said when we come to examine those portions of the tower with which their names are associated with the death of elizabeth the curtain falls on the last of the tudors a race of sovereigns who had used their faithful tower well as palace fortress prison and secret place in which their enemies were put out of existence of many of the greater names of elizabeth reign tower annals bear no record but soldier statesman or ecclesiastic having crossed the queen's humour found it but a step from court favour to traitor's gate in the grey hours of morning march twenty fourth sixteen o three watch and ward was kept in london streets and in all the neighbour counties men who had much at stake in time of crisis wove uncertain plans to meet the thousand chances that day might bring when day broke two horsemen were far on the northern road each spurring to forestall the other at holyrood with homage impatiently expected by the first ruler of the british isles at a more leisurely pace the elizabethan statesmen were riding in from richmond where their mistress lay dead to whitehall gate where at ten in the morning they proclaimed king james i the lords of the council showed themselves agreed that there should be no revolution the decision was silently endorsed by a grateful nation in city and manor-house men laid aside their arms and breathed again in mr g m trevelyan's admirable england under the stuarts from which these words are taken a delightful description is given of the state of england at the coming of the king of scotland to the english throne and the chapters might well be read in connection with any study of tower history 
for to understand the happenings within the tower it is profitable to have some detailed knowledge of the state of society outside its walls king james after his progress during a month of spring weather from edinburgh came to the tower and held his first court there the usual procession to the abbey was abandoned owing to plague that lurked in city streets and rejoicings within tower walls were less lusty than usual but the king rode in state from tower hill to westminster two years later to open his first parliament it is interesting to read in mr sidney lee's life of shakespeare that shakespeare himself with eight players of the king's company of actors walked from the tower of london to westminster in the procession which accompanied the king in his formal entry into london there is no other positive record of the great dramatist and poet having visited the tower we can but conjecture that a building so indissolubly bound up with the nation's history would offer no mute appeal to such a mind as his and that he must have come at times to look upon the place where down to his own day so many tragic deeds had been done early in james's reign many eminent prisoners were brought to the tower in connection with a plot as the timid king thought to place the crown on the head of lady arabella stuart his first cousin on the mother's side in may sixteen eleven lady arabella had married young william seymour this event brought both bride and bridegroom into royal disfavour the husband was shut up in the tower and the wife kept in captivity at lambeth palace but this did not daunt them lady arabella on being taken north on the way to durham pleaded illness when scarcely out of sight of london in disguise she escaped to blackwell and took ship at lee on sea there to await her husband who had succeeded in getting out of the tower by dressing as a labourer and following out a cart laden with wood from the wharf seymour sailed to lee but found that the french vessel in which his wife had sought shelter had gone down the river some hours before he managed to cross to ostend but lady arabella was caught in mid-channel and conveyed back to tower walls which she never left again in her latter years she became insane and dying in sixteen fifteen was buried at midnight beside mary queen of scots in the abbey seymour allowed unmerited punishment to fall on his young wife remained abroad until the storm was over married again and lived long enough to see the restoration the conspiracy of sixteen o three had been the cause of the execution of george brooke brother of lord cobham and two priests went to death with him lord cobham himself and lord grey de wilton were brought to the steps of the scaffold not many days after for participation in the same plot before the headsman had done his work a reprieve arrived and they were sent back to their place of captivity in sixteen o four the guy fox conspiracy necessitated a fresh batch of captives being lodged in the tower and during our visit to the dungeon beneath the white tower we shall learn something of their fate and of the fate also of another prisoner of this period sir thomas overbury poisoned in the bloody tower felton the rogue responsible for the assassination of buckingham had bought the knife with which he did the deed on tower hill at a booth there he was brought to the tower on his arrest and confined until the day of his hanging at tyburn there were not always however political offences that filled the tower cells at this period a private quarrel was the cause of lords arundel and spencer being given quarters in the prison and lord audley was beheaded on tower hill in sixteen thirty one for committing crimes which were so revolting as to encourage the belief that he was insane when charles i who did not visit the tower as far as is known during his life the number of noble prisoners by no means grows less in november sixteen forty the earl of strafford was put in the tower and condemned to death after trial in westminster hall the king was anxious to save him the tower was to be seized and strafford set at liberty the royal plans failed charles forsook his favourite even after having sworn that not a hair of his head should be injured the prisoner could anticipate but one end sweetheart he wrote to his wife it is long since i wrote to you for i am here in such trouble as gives me little or no respite archbishop laud had also been put in the prison fortress 
and as strafford passed down the sloping pathway that leads from tower green to traitor's gate on his way to execution laud from the window above the arch of bloody tower gave his friend his blessing the earl was led out to tower hill and suffered death there on may twelfth sixteen forty one it is said that two hundred thousand people witnessed the event and that it was celebrated by the lighting of bonfires at night the archbishop had been arrested at lambeth palace and brought to the tower by the river he remained for four years in his room in the bloody tower and in his diary describes the visit paid to him by prynne who seeing me safe in bed falls first to my pockets to rifle them in the search for papers which he found in plenty he bound up my papers left two sentinels at my door and went his way on march tenth sixteen forty three laud was brought to a trial in westminster hall which lasted twenty days because he had so the charge was worded attempted to subvert religion and the fundamental laws of the realm he was condemned and on tower hill on january tenth sixteen forty five when seventy-two years of age beheaded he was buried as we shall see in a later chapter in the church of all hallows barking near by readers of john inglesant will remember the vivid description given in that book of these days in the reign of the first charles and in the moving picture of the life of the time laud played no inconsiderable part laud says bishop collins in his exhaustive laud commemoration volume deserves to be commemorated as among other things a true forerunner of social leaders of our own day to him at any rate a man is a man and no man can be more the great the rich the educated had no hope of favour from him rather he reserved his mercy for the poor the ignorant and the lowly we thank god for his noble care for the poor and his large and generous alms for the english race for his splendid example of diligent service in church and state for his work as the great promoter of learning of his age from such an authority these words are valuable and do much to set the balance right after the splenetic outbursts of carlyle and many a lesser writer august sixteen forty two had seen the outbreak of the civil war charles was at nottingham the tower was in the keeping of parliament and its captives were those who adhered to the king we find a lord mayor of london amongst them for publishing the king's proclamation with regard to the militia and gallant cavaliers in plenty filled the cells sir john hotham and his son charged with attempting to give hull over to the royalists while it was being held for parliament were brought to the tower in sixteen forty three and to tower hill in the following year sir alexander carew governor of plymouth was beheaded shortly afterwards on a similar indictment when the king had himself suffered death at the block in whitehall the tower contained many of his supporters and amongst those who shared their royal master's fate were the earl of holland the duke of hamilton and arthur lord capel a fine old knight of wales sir john owen taken at the same time and condemned to death was by ireton's intercession pardoned and he returned in peace to wales worcester sent a batch of prisoners to the fortress and in the same year sixteen fifty one a preacher at st lawrence jewry named christopher love found to be in correspondence with the second charles was beheaded on tower hill a picture of the scene on the hill at the time of his death engraved by a dutchman is one of the first drawings after those of strafford and laud of an execution on that famous spot lucy barlow mother of the duke of monmouth who had been imprisoned in the tower with her young son was released by cromwell after a long detention cromwell was during the last years of the protectorate in constant fear of assassination miles syndicombe at one time in his confidence made an attempt on his life in sixteen fifty seven having been sentenced to death syndicombe took fate in his own hands terminated his life in the solitude of his cell and the body was dragged at a horse's tail from tower hill to tyburn dr john hewitt concerned in a rising in kent in favour of the restoration was beheaded on tower hill with another plotter sir henry slingsley 
the frequent escapes from tower walls during the commonwealth period would lead to the belief that the place was not guarded with the customary rigour when cromwell was in power but when he died the tower became an important centre of attention colonel fitz then lieutenant had so it is said arranged to admit three hundred men of the parliamentary army this little negotiation was not carried to its desired conclusion and a fresh garrison was placed in the fortress on discovery of the plot but unrest was evident within the walls the lack of agreement of those in charge was followed by the seizure of the tower by general monk in the name of charles the second he released numbers of cromwellian prisoners and placed a strong garrison there under major nicholson during the months that passed before the return of charles the tower held many important prisoners in sixteen sixty colonel john lambert was made captive for opposing monk's scheme for the restoration pepys who comes upon the scene to illumine the time with his detailed accounts of happenings grave and gay gives as related by Rugg, an account of lambert's escape at eight of the clock at night it appears he slid down by a rope tied fast to his window and was awaited by men ready to take him off by the river she who made the bed being privy to his escape that night to blind the warder when he came to lock the chamber door went to bed and possessed colonel lambert's place and put on his nightcap this interesting female was duly discovered in the morning after having deluded the jailer by replying in a manly voice to his good night the evening before and was herself made captive for her temerity lambert who had succeeded in getting to warwickshire was recaptured and subsequently banished when charles the second came to the throne the early years of his rule were occupied in punishing with merciless severity all who had in any way been aiders or abettors of those responsible for his father's tragic death in the restoration year the marquis of argyle afterwards executed at edinburgh was a tower prisoner poor sir harry vane not in any way convicted of complicity with the regicides was brought to tower hill in sixteen sixty two and there suffered execution without a shadow of justice to cover the crime pepys rose at four o'clock in the morning of the day when vane was to suffer about eleven o'clock we all went out to tower hill and there over against the scaffold made on purpose this day saw sir harry vane brought a very great press of people the people of london at that time went out to see men brought to the block just as their successors patronized a lord mayor's show pepys had taken a window in trinity square but was unable to see the actual fall of the axe because the scaffold was so crowded that we could not see it done charles the second was the last of the kings to sleep in the tower the night before coronation and he in keeping with tradition made a number of knights of the bath who would after the ceremonies in st john's chapel ride with him in the procession to westminster on the following day of course pepys had secured a window in cornhill and there we had a good room to ourselves with wine and good cake and saw the show very well glorious was the show with gold and silver that we were not able to look at our eyes at last being so much overcome but the volatile diarist has sufficiently recovered the power of vision to observe that both the king and duke of york took notice of us as they saw us at the window this proved to be one of the most glorious cavalcades that ever left the tower the great fire of sixteen sixty six put the tower in great danger had it reached the walls and set alight the stores of gunpowder lying within we should have had very little of the work of the conqueror and henry the third left to us the king himself had ordered the demolition of surrounding buildings and by such means was the progress of the fire checked pepys of course was running about and we hear of him on one of the high places of the tower where he was able to look towards london bridge and did see an infinite great fire george villiers second duke of buckingham began his series of five imprisonments in the tower in sixteen fifty eight during the protectorate and continued them well into charles's reign but though constantly in trouble his offences were as constantly forgiven by the king and he was never a captive very long 
of colonel blood's escapade in sixteen seventy one something will be said in the third chapter but the irrepressible pepys was hunting for treasure not crown jewels in sixteen sixty two when he was led to believe a sum of seven thousand pounds was hid in the tower he and assistants set to work to dig for this hidden gold but it raining and the work being done in the open garden the search was abandoned the treasure is yet undiscovered the amazing pepys was himself a captive in the tower from may sixteen seventy nine to february sixteen eighty and seems to have lived fairly well there if the account of his expenses be any criterion william penn was also a captive about this time and wrote no cross no crown during his imprisonment that singular invention of titus oates called the popish plot sent about forty men to the block among them william lord stafford who was executed on tower hill on december twenty ninth sixteen eighty three years later the rye house plot brought lord william russell and algernon sidney to the tower and execution while essex who had been also lodged in the dungeons and had like russell and sidney not actually been concerned in the assassination scheme planned at rye house was found in his prison with his throat cut james the second omitted the procession from tower to westminster and it has never since been observed as a necessary prelude to a king's coronation there is no likelihood of the custom ever being revived now that the tower has fallen from its high estate as a royal residence the young son of lucy walters who had lived in the tower as we have seen as a boy now returned as the defeated duke of monmouth beloved of the people for his handsome face but unstable in character he was beheaded in sixteen eighty five on tower hill having been led there with difficulty through the dense crowd of citizens gathered to see him die and to cheer him on the sad way up to the top of the hill and the scaffold a contemporary engraving shows the excited populace packed closely together in solid ranks jack ketch the headsman was almost torn limb from limb by the infuriated mob when he had made four ineffectual strokes on the neck of the victim and had severed the head with the fifth the seven bishops came to the martin tower in sixteen eighty eight and judge jeffreys of infamous record died in the bloody tower what was the fate that lodged him in a place so appropriately named in sixteen eighty nine king james had fled the country and without bloodshed the great revolution of sixteen eighty eight was brought about sir william fenwick who had been found guilty of high treason was the only victim brought to tower hill during the time of william and mary but there were many prisoners of state in the tower partisans for the most part of the stuarts charles lord mohun was made a prisoner within the walls in this reign not for adhering to their majesty's enemies but for having killed a celebrated comedian in a quarrel about a famous actress in sixteen ninety five sir christopher wren examined the beecham and bloody towers to report what it would cost to repair and put them in a condition to hold more prisoners the tower capacities it is evident were being tested to the utmost limit queen anne had some french prisoners of war immured in the tower soon after her accession and in seventeen twelve sir robert walpole was nominally a captive there i say nominally because his apartment during his confinement from february to july was crowded by fashionable visitors whose carriages blocked the gateway at the foot of tower hill we are indeed in modern times when captivity in the old fortress prison was treated as a society function walpole's rooms were after his release occupied i used this milder term as he could not in the strict sense be called a captive by the earl of lansdowne author of that unpresentable comedy the old gallant with the house of hanover the tower records take a graver turn under george i the rebellion of seventeen fifteen brought young derwinter taken prisoner at preston to the tower lord kenmure was captured at the same time with other jacobite lords and was brought with derwentwater to tower hill and there together they were executed kenmure was put to death first 
and all marks of his tragic end having been removed from the scaffold derwentwater was brought out of the house on tower hill where catherine house now stands to suffer on the same block the crowd in trinity square had been disappointed of a third victim for lord nithsdale as we shall see later managed to escape from the tower on the evening before in seventeen twenty two the jacobites plotted to seize the tower their plan failed they were made prisoners there instead and lay in the dungeons for several months we have passed through the period of the black dwarf and come to the days of waverley and the romantic forty five in seventeen forty four three men of a highland regiment which had mutinied on being ordered to flanders after being promised that foreign service should not be required were shot on tower green others were sent to the plantations this roused great resentment in scotland and prepared the way for the coming of prince charles edward who landed on the island of Eriske in july seventeen forty five this young hero of incomparable song and story was to quote andrew lang the last of a princely lineage whose annals are a world's wonder for pity and crime and sorrow and prince charlie has excelled them all in his share of the confessed yet mysterious charm of his house after culloden a sad harvest was reaped on tower hill and we shall hear more of the last of the jacobites who perished at the block for their loyalty when we visit the scene of their sufferings a few political prisoners in george the third's reign the committal of arthur o'connor one of the united irishmen in seventeen ninety eight the imprisonment of sir francis burdett in eighteen ten and the placing there of the cato street conspirators in eighteen twenty brings our list of captives to a close in queen victoria's time on october thirty eighteen forty one a fire occurred within the inner ward of the tower which threatened at one time during its fury to make sad havoc of surrounding buildings the storehouse of arms which stood where the barracks are now placed to the east of st peter's church was gutted and the smoke and flames were blown over towards the white tower fortunately the store alone was destroyed and it was reported to have been ugly enough to deserve its fate the tower's last trial came upon it unawares in january twenty four eighteen eighty five when the finians laid an infernal machine in the banqueting-room of the white tower the explosion that followed did considerable damage to the exhibits in the building and many visitors were injured but the white tower itself secure in its rock-like strength was in no way the worse for what might in more modern buildings have rent the walls asunder end of chapter two part two chapter three of the tower of london by arthur poyser this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three a walk through the tower part one the raised portcullis arch they pass the wicket with its bars of brass the entrance long and low flanked at each turn by loopholes straight where bowmen might in ambush wait if force or fraud should burst the gate to gall an entering foe scott the gascoigne plan of fifteen ninety seven reproduced at the end of this book will show a straggling line of buildings running partly up the slope of tower hill and terminating in what was known as the bulwark gate it was there that prisoners with the exception of course of those who came by water to traitor's gate were in tudor times delivered to the custodians of the tower and it was there also that all who were to be executed on tower hill were given by the tower authorities into the charge of the city officials grass grew on the hill and its river slope in those days and leaving the tower gateway behind one would as it were step into an open meadow the declivity towards the moat on one side and the cottages of petty wales on the other the aspect of this main entrance to the tower has been so altered that it is a little difficult nowadays to reconstruct it in imagination 
the moat made a semicircular bend where the present wooden stockade stands and it had to be crossed at least twice some accounts say three times before the byward tower could be reached the first drawbridge was protected by the lion gate the lion tower stood near by to command that gate and was surrounded by the waters of the moat all trace of these outer barbicans and waterways has disappeared the towers have been pulled down the ditch filled up to make the modern approach to the wharf on the right within the present wooden gateway the unattractive erection known as the ticket office occupies the site of the royal menagerie which existed here from the days of our norman kings to the year eighteen thirty four when it was removed to regent's park and from which the present zoo has developed in the time of henry the third twelve fifty two the sheriffs of london were ordered to pay fourpence a day for the maintenance of a white bear and to provide a muzzle and chain to hold him while fishing in the thames in henry's reign the first elephant seen in england since the time of the romans came to the tower menagerie and lions and leopards followed james i and his friends came here frequently to see lions and bears baited by dogs and in seventeen o eight stripe the historian mentions eagles owls and two cats of the mountain as occupants of the cages in eighteen twenty nine and during the last five years of its existence here the collection consisted of lions tigers leopards a jaguar puma ocelot caracal cheetah striped hyena hyena dog wolves civet cats gray ichneumon paradoxterus brown coati raccoon and a pit of bears the master of the king's bears and apes was an official of some importance and received the princely salary of three halfpence a day but this was in plantagenet times middle tower the first tower that the visitor of to-day passes under is called by reason of its position at one time in the centre of the old ditch the middle tower its great circular bastions commanded the outer drawbridge and its gateway was defended by a double portcullis the sharp turn in the approach formerly a bridge now a paved roadway to this tower would make it impossible to rush this gateway with any success when elizabeth returned as queen to the tower which she had left five years before as prisoner it was in front of this middle tower that she alighted from her horse and fell on her knees to return thanks to god as bishop burnett writes who had delivered her from a danger so eminent and from an escape as miraculous as that of david the moat and byward tower the bridge and causeway connecting the middle and byward towers has altered little in appearance and looks to-day very much as it does in gascoigne's plan but the broad moat has been drained the water was pumped out in eighteen forty three and the bed filled up with gravel and soil to form a drill ground it was across that portion of the moat lying to the north under tower hill that two attempts at escape were made in the last year of charles the first reign monk the future duke of albemarle had been taken captive at the siege of nantwich by fairfax and was a prisoner in the tower for three years with him were brought two fellow prisoners lord maguire and colonel macmahon they managed to escape from their cell by sawing through the door at night and lowered themselves from the tower walls to the ditch by means of a rope which they had found according to directions conveyed to them from without inside a loaf of bread they succeeded in swimming the moat but were unlucky enough to surprise a sentry stationed near the middle tower who had heard the splash they made when leaving the rope and jumping into the water on their coming to the opposite bank they were retaken cast back into the prison and shortly afterwards hanged at tyburn the lieutenant of the tower was heavily fined for allowing the escape poor man a few years afterwards lord capel made captive at the surrender of colchester castle broke prison by having had tools and a rope secretly conveyed to him with instructions as to which part of the moat he should find most shallow with deliberation he performed all that was necessary to get himself outside the walls 
but he found the depth of the ditch exceed his expectations attempting to wade across he was nearly dragged under water by the weight of mud that clogged his feet and was at one point in his perilous progress through the water about to call loudly for help lest he should be unable to continue the exertion necessary and so be drowned however cheered by friends waiting under cover of bushes on the tower hill bank he came at last to firm ground he was carried to rooms in the temple and from thence conveyed some days later to lambeth but the boatman who had carried the fugitive and his friends from the temple stairs guessing who his passenger was raised an alarm capel was discovered put again in the tower and beheaded in march sixteen forty nine beside westminster hall the grim-looking byward tower is said to have been so named from the fact that the byword or password had to be given at its gateway before admittance could be gained even to the outer ward of the fortress on that side of it nearest the river a postern gateway leads to a small drawbridge across the ditch this gave access to the royal landing-place on the wharf immediately opposite and in this way privileged persons were able to enter the tower without attention to those formalities necessary to gain entry to the buildings in the ordinary way in the byward tower to the right under the archway is the warder's parlour a finely vaulted room and outside its doorway we meet one or two of those yeomen warders whose picturesque uniform so closely associated with the tower was designed by holbein the painter and dates from tudor days these yeomen warders are sworn in as special constables whose duties lie within the jurisdiction of the tower and they take rank with sergeant majors in the army when state trials were held in westminster hall the yeoman jailer escorted the prisoner to and from the tower carrying the processional axe still preserved in the king's house here the edge of the axe was turned towards the captive after his trial during the sad return to the prison-house if he had as was nearly always the case been condemned to die this yeoman still carries the historic axe in state processions but it is now merely an emblem of a vanished power to destroy allied to the warders are a body of men known as the yeomen of the guard or beef-eaters who attend on the king's person at all his state functions whether it be in procession or at levee the yeomen were first seen beyond tower walls in the coronation procession of henry the seventh the eastern front of the byward tower has a quaint old-world appearance and has altered little since elizabethan days bell tower this old tower at the angle of the ballium wall contained at one time within the turret still to be seen above its roof the tower bell which in former days was used as an alarm signal in the regulations of sixteen o seven we find that when the tower bell doth ring at nights for the shutting in of the gates all the prisoners with their servants are to withdraw themselves into their chambers and not to go forth that night the walls built by henry the third are of immense strength the masonry being solid for fully ten feet above the ground the tower contains an upper and a lower dungeon the former lit by comparatively modern windows the latter still possessing narrow openings or arrow slits in the upper cell the walls of which are eight feet thick four notable prisoners were confined bishop fisher and anne boleyn in henry the eighth's time princess elizabeth in mary's reign and lady arabella stuart in the days of james the first fisher was eighty years old when brought to linger here in cold in rags and in misery the aged bishop had refused to comply with the act of succession and acknowledge henry supreme head of the church of england from this prison he wrote to cromwell my diet also god knoweth how slender it is at any times and now in mine age my stomach may not away but with a few kind of meats which if i want i decay forthwith and fall into crafts and diseases of my body and cannot keep myself in health 
but no alleviation of his sufferings did he obtain and early in the morning when winter and spring had passed away and slender rays of june sunshine had found entrance to his dismal dwelling-place the lieutenant of the tower came to him to announce that a message from the king had arrived and that fisher was to suffer death that day the bishop took this as happy tidings granting release from intolerable conditions of life at nine o'clock he was carried to little tower hill towards the present royal mint buildings praying as he went on the scaffold he exclaimed accedet ad eum et illuminamini et facies vestre non confundentur with hands uplifted and having spoken some few words to the crowd around was repeating the words of the thirty-first psalm in thee o lord have i put my trust when the axe fell into the lower dungeon sir thomas more was taken in the same month as fisher april fifteen thirty four more had been friend and companion to king henry and had held the office of lord chancellor after wolsey but past friendship and high services were forgotten when with fisher he refused to accept the oath in the act of succession and he was committed to the tower for fifteen months he lay confined in this close filthy prison shut up among mice and rats and was so weakened as to be scarce able to stand when taken to the scaffold on tower hill on july sixth fifteen thirty five in mr prothero's psalms in human life his last moments are thus described the scaffold was unsteady and as he put his foot on the ladder he said to the lieutenant i pray thee see me safe up and for my coming down let me shift for myself after kneeling down on the scaffold and repeating the psalm have mercy upon me o god psalm fifty one which had always been his favourite prayer he placed his head on the low log that served as a block and received the fatal stroke his head was placed on london bridge but soon afterwards it was claimed by his devoted daughter and was buried with her at canterbury when she died in fifteen forty four the bodies of fisher and moore are buried side by side in st peter's on tower green but fisher's remains had rested for some years in all hallows barking on tower hill before removal to the tower chapel at the entrance to the upper chamber of the bell tower from the passage on the wall known as queen elizabeth's walk there is the following inscription on the stone by torture strange my truth was tried yet of my liberty denied therefore reason hath me persuaded that patience must be embraced though hard fortune chases me with smart yet patience shall prevail beyond the bell tower a broad window with balcony will be noticed in the adjacent king's house this gives light to a room known as the council chamber in which guy fawkes and his fellow conspirators were tried and condemned to the rack above the fireplace in this room an elaborate carving preserves the features of the first steward who sat on the english throne and near by the many virtues lest their existence should be doubted by unbelievers of that amiable monarch are set forth for all to read who may in this room pepys did go to dine february sixteen sixty three four with sir j robinson then lieutenant of the tower his ordinary table being very good james duke of monmouth taken as a fugitive after sedgemoor was imprisoned in this house sixteen eighty five till his execution and here he parted from his wife and children during the last sad hours traitor's gate and st thomas's tower if any were asked what impressed them most during their visit to the tower or what they desired to see when planning that visit i think that they would name the traitor's gate it is certainly the best preserved of the tudor portions has been least spoiled by intrusion of irrelevant things and is left in its quietness to the doves that incessantly flit in and out of the crevices of its stones and rest upon the bars of its massive gateway above it rises the great arch sixty-two feet span supporting st thomas tower built as has already been stated by henry the third and named after st thomas of canterbury
this water-gate as it was at one time called was the only direct way of entering the tower from the river and before the draining of the moat the gate here was always partly covered by water and boats were brought right up to the steps in front of the bloody tower they were moored to the heavy iron ring that is still to be seen at the left of the archway of the tower just mentioned the older steps will be noticed beneath the more modern stone facings laid upon them and those steps have been trodden by some of the most famous men and women in our history it will be remembered that between these steps and the gloomy archway leading up to the tower green the condemned sir thomas more met on his way to the bell tower his daughter who in a frenzy of grief thrust her way through the guards and flung herself on her father's neck crying in despair o oh, my father my father those who record the scene say that even the stern warders were moved to tears when the father gave his child his last blessing and she was led away from him to these steps came anne boleyn cromwell earl of essex queen catherine howard seymour duke of somerset lady jane grey princess elizabeth Devereux, earl of essex the duke of monmouth and the seven bishops in the room above the gate lord grey de wilton died sixteen fourteen after eleven years of imprisonment on the mere accusation of wishing to marry arabella stuart without permission of king james i st thomas's tower at one time as is evident from the old piscina discovered there contained a chapel the tower has been carefully restored without and within and is now the residence of the keeper of the crown jewels the bloody tower in henry the eighth's reign this was known as the garden tower and took its name from the constable's garden now the parade in front of the king's house but since elizabeth's time it has been called the bloody tower owing it is surmised to the suicide therein of henry percy eighth earl of northumberland in fifteen eighty five but that is the least of its mysteries it was within this tower that the young princes disappeared in july fourteen eighty three they had been removed from the royal palace near this tower when richard assumed kingship and placed within these grim chambers they were closely watched all help from without would be offered in vain their spirits drooped and the feeling crept upon them that they would never leave their prison-house alive sir robert brackenbury had become lieutenant of the tower to him richard who was riding towards gloucester sent a messenger with letters asking him if he would be willing to rid the king of the princes this messenger had delivered his paper to the lieutenant as he knelt at prayer in the chapel of st john in the white tower brackenbury refused the king's request and said he would be no party to such an act even if his refusal cost him his life the messenger returned in haste spurred his horse westward and overtook richard at warwick the king finding brackenbury obdurate sent off sir james tyrrell with a warrant to obtain possession of the keys of the tower for one night the keys were given to him and he assumed command of the place for the time two ruffians john dighton and a miles forrest some say a third was there reminding one of the mysterious third murderer in macbeth crept into the bedroom of the sleeping boys and smothered them with the bedclothes shakespeare has painted the scene so vividly that though the actual manner of death is unknown this one is accepted as probably nearest the truth tyrrell saw the dead bodies gave orders that they should be buried secretly at the foot of the stairs then resigning the keys rode off to give the news to richard tyrrell came himself to death at tower hill in later years and his accomplices died in misery in charles the second's days two skeletons were found under the steps not of this tower but of the white tower and were laid in westminster abbey sir walter raleigh was a captive in the bloody tower from sixteen o four to sixteen sixteen and in its chambers he wrote the portion of his history of the world that he was able to finish before his later troubles and death put an end to his labours it is pleasant to hear of raleigh spending his days with his great work to cheer him at one time sitting in the constable's garden at another conversing from the walls with those who passed to and fro below 
but his writings were not sufficient to satisfy the energies of this son of an energetic age he set up a laboratory with retorts and furnaces and made chemical experiments and so it happened that at this time to quote the elder disraeli raleigh was surrounded in the tower by the highest literary and scientific circle in the nation these men of mark in the earlier years of the first stuart king came as guests to the tower or had the misfortune to be detained there during the king's pleasure raleigh's wife and son lived with him and they had their own servants to wait on them but the lieutenant of the tower sir george harvey with whom raleigh had spent long evenings and with whom he had made warm friendship was succeeded by sir william wad who seems to have taken a personal dislike to sir walter and contrived to make his life as miserable as possible in sixteen ten raleigh was kept a close prisoner for three months and his wife and child no longer allowed to share his captivity were banished the tower a decree that would prove only too welcome to many and lived for some time in a house on tower hill in sixteen fifteen the king consented to release raleigh and allow him to command an expedition to el dorado which set off in sixteen seventeen what the result of that unfortunate voyage was all know mutiny and despair may best describe its end the king was furious his greed for spanish gold was unsatisfied spain demanded the head of one who had been her mortal enemy a decision had to be made whether raleigh should be delivered to the spaniard or put back in the tower his wife planned escape for the husband she had sacrificed every comfort to aid on a sunday night when sir walter was detained in the city in his wife's house in broad street he put on disguise crept through the narrow lanes to tower hill went down by all hallows church to tower dock where a boat was waiting to receive him and take him to a ship at tilbury but when the watermen put out into the water they saw a second boat following them closely sir walter was betrayed by a man he had trusted and found himself a prisoner in the tower once again he was shut up in the brick tower where he awaited his trial then removed to the gatehouse by westminster hall when his sentence was passed and he had but a few days to live his wife remained with him and they parted at the midnight before execution in the morning the dean of westminster gave him his last communion and at eight o'clock he went out to old palace yard cheerfully prepared for what was to follow in the bloody tower sir thomas overbury was poisoned in sixteen thirteen this is one of the blackest crimes that stain tower history overbury had been a friend of raleigh's and had often visited him in his confinement now sir thomas himself because he had condemned the marriage between the earl of somerset and lady frances howard was brought to the same tower lady frances determined to have overbury put out of the way and a notorious quack and procuress of the period mrs turner had been hired to administer the drug but this slow poisoning proving too lengthy a process two hired assassins ended overbury's sufferings by smothering him at night with the pillows of his bed some time afterwards by the confession of a boy who had been at the time in the employment of the apothecary from whom the drugs were bought the crime was disclosed horror and indignation caused a public outcry for vengeance the lieutenant of the tower elwes with mrs turner and the two murderers were all put to death somerset and his countess were imprisoned in the room in the bloody tower where overbury had died they were eventually pardoned and lived in seclusion and disgrace another victim who died in this tower during charles i's reign was sir john elliot a man of great abilities and at one time vice-admiral of devon he had already been imprisoned and released before his entry to the tower in sixteen twenty nine and he passed away in his cell in sixteen thirty two mr trevelyan has said of him his letters speeches and actions in the tower reveal a spirit of cheerfulness and even of humour admirable in one who knows that he has chosen to die in prison in the hands of victorious enemies during his last months he contracted consumption in his unhealthy quarters and suffered harsh treatment 
even when sir john had died the hard-hearted king refused to allow his body to be given to his relatives for burial and commanded him to be buried in the parish in which he died he was laid to rest in the chapel on tower green which may be called the parish church of the tower felton the murderer of buckingham was thrown into this tower in sixteen twenty eight and archbishop laud was prisoner here from december sixteen sixteen forty to january tenth sixteen forty four here also in july sixteen eighty three arthur capel earl of essex cut his own throat as the register of st peter ad vincula shows the infamous judge jeffreys came here as prisoner in sixteen eighty eight having been taken in a low alehouse in wapping and is reported to have spent his days in bloody tower imbibing strong drink from the effects of which employment he died in sixteen eighty nine this old tower has tragedy and misery enough in its records to deserve its name and it is a mistake on the part of tower authorities to allow so interesting a building to be closed altogether to the public the narrow chamber above the archway on the south side still contains all the machinery for raising and lowering the portcullis which when down would at one time have prevented all access to the inner ward this is believed to be the only ancient portcullis in england that is still in working order the wakefield tower the lower portion of this tower is with the white tower one of the oldest portions of all the buildings and was laid down in norman times henry the third rebuilt the upper part and it served as the entrance to his palace which lay to the east during the commonwealth the great hall in which anne boleyn was tried and which was attached to this tower was demolished the name wakefield was given to the tower after the battle of wakefield in fourteen sixty when the captive yorkists were lodged here in former times the tower had been called the record tower and the hall tower in the octagonal chamber where the crown jewels are now kept the recess to the south-east was at one time an oratory in tower records of the thirteenth century it is so spoken of here tradition asserts that henry the sixth was murdered by duke richard of gloucester who entering the chamber from the palace found henry at prayer and treacherously stabbed him to death to the dungeon beneath this tower the men who were out in the forty five and who were taken captive after that rebellion which was crushed at culloden were brought and huddled together with so little regard for the necessity of fresh air that many of them died on the damp earthen floor of the cell the walls of this dungeon are thirteen feet thick from floor to vaulted roof within there is only ten feet space those men who survived even the terrors of this place and whose hearts remain true to the royal house of stuart were shipped off to the west indies and so ended an old zang the wonder the bravery the sacrifice and sadness of it all is set down for after ages to marvel at in waverley happy those who fell at culloden for they at least rest under the heather they escaped the miserable english dungeons and the wickednesses of the plantations as we leave the wakefield tower we pass down under the archway of the bloody tower and in going eastwards and turning to the left a few yards farther on come to the foot of the grassy slope at the top of which stands the great white tower tinkered at by wren but otherwise to-day much as the conqueror left it in this now open ground where has been placed the gun carriages on which the body of queen victoria was carried from windsor railway station to st george's chapel on that memorable second of february nineteen o one rose in plantagenet and tudor days the royal palace in the tower and the hall in which the courts of justice sat the court of common pleas was held in this great hall by the river a gothic building dating probably from the reign of henry the third the court of king's bench being held in the lesser hall under the east turret of the keep or white tower at certain times the right of public entry of all citizens to the tower was insisted on but a certain ceremonial had to be observed beforehand 
the aldermen and commoners met in all hallows barking church on tower hill and chose six sage persons to go as a deputation to the tower and ask leave to see the king and demand free access for all people to the courts of law held within the tower it was also to be granted that no guard should keep watch over them or close the gates a most necessary precaution their request being granted by the king the six messengers returned to barking church and the commons then elected three men of standing to act as spokesmen great care was taken that no person should go into the royal presence who was in rags or shoeless every one was to have his hair cut close and his face newly shaved mayor alderman sheriff crier beadles were all to be clean and neat and every one was to lay aside his cape and cloak and put on his coat and surcoat end of chapter three part one chapter three of the tower of london by arthur poyser this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three a walk through the tower part two the white tower or keep this is the very heart and centre of the tower buildings and all the lesser towers and connecting walls making the inner and outer wards and the broad moat encircling it are but the means of protection and inviolable security of this ancient keep within its rock-like walls a threatened king could live in security here were provided the elementary necessaries of life a storehouse for food a well to supply fresh water a great fireplace in the thickness of the wall and a place of devotion all within the walls of this one tower the doorway by which we enter after passing the ridiculous ticket-box and unnecessary policeman was cut through the solid wall in henry the eighth's time at the foot of the stairs giving access the bones of the murdered princes were found in a small chest some ten feet below the ground during charles the second's reign the winding stairway within the wall leads us to the western end of the chapel of st john which is with the possible exception of the lady chapel at durham the finest norman chapel in england it has a beautiful arcading with heavy circular pillars square capitals and bases and a wide triforium over the aisles here is a perfect norman church in miniature the south aisle at one time communicated with the royal palace and the gallery with the state apartments of the keep it is only within recent years that the sanctity of the place has been again observed and now visitors behave here as in any other consecrated building but it was for many years used as a sort of store chamber and the authorities at one time proposed turning it into a military tailor's workshop that was in the mid-nineteenth century when england in general had fallen into a state of artistic zoff and the daughters of music were brought low so low too had the guardians of the nation fallen in their ideas that this beautiful building meant nothing more to them than a place a commodious place of four stone walls that was lying idle and might be put to some practical use the prince consort made timely intervention and the desecration was not persisted in it was in this chapel that the rabble in richard the second's time found archbishop sudbury at prayer at prayer too in this chapel knelt brackenbury when the messenger from king richard the third brought demands for the prince's murder here elizabeth of york queen of henry the seventh lay in state after death here queen mary after the death of her brother edward the sixth attended mass and gave thanks for the suppression of revolt and here the vacillating northumberland father-in-law of lady jane grey declared himself a roman catholic lest he should lose his life but without the effect he desired in this solemn place too those who aspired to knighthood watched their arms at the altar passing the night in vigil before the day when the king would elect them to the order this was the place of worship of our norman and plantagenet kings could any other building in the country claim like associations yet these things slipped the mind of a generation and then is the hallowed ground made desolate 
the large rooms entered from the chapel are the former state apartments now given over to the housing of a collection of weapons and armour which is described on the showcases and therefore need not be detailed here in these rooms balliol in the reign of edward i and king david of scotland in that of edward the third were kept prisoners but not in the strictest sense other notable captives here were king john of france after the battle of poitiers prince afterwards king james of scotland and charles duke of orleans all of whom have been spoken of in the previous chapter several models of the tower buildings made at various periods will be found in these rooms the larger western apartment in which are preserved the block and axe used at the last execution on tower hill in seventeen forty seven is the banqueting hall of the keep and was the scene so some maintain of the trial of anne boleyn in may fifteen thirty six raleigh in sixteen o one watched the execution of essex from one of its western windows a mounted figure of queen elizabeth dressed as on the occasion of her progress to st paul's cathedral to render thanks for the destruction of the armada has been removed from this room to a dark corner of the crypt of st john's chapel its place is taken by an illuminated showcase in which the coronation robes of the reigning sovereign are displayed models of the instruments of torture the rack thumbscrew scavenger's daughter iron neck collar and so forth are shown in this room reminding us that though torture was never legal punishment in england it was practised in tower dungeons especially in tudor times when in the wisdom of those in power occasion demanded it but the whole business is too despicable to dwell upon a continuation of the winding stairway in the southwest angle of the wall gives access to the upper floor and ancient council chamber which is the room entered first here richard the second abdicated in favour of henry the fourth frossard describing the ceremony says king richard was released from his prison and entered the hall which had been prepared for the occasion royally dressed the sceptre in his hand and the crown on his head but without supporters on either side he said after raising the crown from his head and placing it before him henry fair cousin and duke of lancaster i present and give to you this crown with which i was crowned king of england and all the rights dependent on it when all was over and henry had called in a public notary that an authentic act should be drawn up of the proceedings richard was led back to where he had come from and the duke and other lords mounted their horses to return home it was in this council chamber of the white tower also that richard the third enacted that dramatic scene on which the curtain fell with the death of hastings the lord chamberlain the lords were seated at council when richard entered the broad low room in anger and exclaimed to their astonishment what are they worthy to have that compass and imagine my destruction the lords sore amazed at this sat dumb and none dared speak lest he be accused then the irate richard bared his withered arm and called on all to look what sorcery had done his protestation had however been somewhat overacted and his lords in the chamber of council saw that he was but in a fit of spleen and hasty to pick a quarrel with any still lord hastings took courage to stand and reply if any have so heinously done they are worthy of heinous punishment what said richard starting up thou servest me ill i ween with ifs i tell thee they have so done and that i will make good on thy body traitor in great anger he strode to a table and hit it heavily with his clenched fist at this signal a great number of armed men who had been cunningly hid in the stone passage that lay within the thickness of the wall entered the room and blocked the doorways richard coming into the centre of the chamber and pointing to hastings exclaimed i arrest thee traitor what me my lord replied the chamberlain yea thee traitor and hastings being seized and made prisoner i will not to dinner continued his accuser till i see thy head off without time to say a word on his own behalf lord hastings in order that the repast of richard should not be unduly delayed was hurried down the narrow winding stairway in the northeast turret of the white tower and led out upon what is now the parade-ground below 
it is told that the way to the block on tower green near by was greatly obstructed by stones and much timber then being used in rebuilding houses within the tower walls richard was watching with impatience from a window in the council chamber the progress of his victim to death and in order to avoid delay hastings was compelled by his captors to lay his head on a rough log of wood that blocked the path so was he brought to the axe ere richard satisfied and himself again went to dine the crypt of st john's chapel which with the dungeons is shown only to those who have obtained an order and are accompanied by a special warder a very dark place before the comparatively modern windows were put in was used as a prison cell and here were confined those captured in the wyatt rebellion prisoners inscriptions may still be seen on the wall on either side of the smaller dungeon erroneously termed raleigh's cell this grim chamber hollowed out of the wall of the crypt would when the door was shut and all light of day excluded have been the most unwelcome hole for any human being to linger in to assert that raleigh sat and wrote here by rushlight is drawing too heavily on our credulity even that beast wad would not have put his famous prisoner into such a place of darkness the crypt has a remarkable barrel-shaped roof the stones of which are most cunningly set together the walls are of amazing thickness as may be seen by the depth of the window recesses some few years ago a quantity of stained glass was found in this crypt some of it of sixteenth century date the remainder modern and of little value fragments of this glass have been put together with care and skill and placed in the small windows of the chapel of st john above the larger dungeons of the keep are entered beneath the stairway that leads to the parade ground from the level of the crypt we have just visited these lower places of confinement have been sadly modernized whitewashed and have all the appearance of respectable wine cellars lit by electric light in these once gloomy chambers deep down below the level of the ground stood the rack the cries of victims would not be heard beyond the massive walls this instrument of torture was an open frame of solid oak about three feet high the prisoner was laid within it on the bare ground his wrists and ankles being tied to rollers at each extremity by means of levers these rollers were moved in opposite directions and the body of the prisoner was thereby raised to the level of the frame while his body was thus suspended he was questioned and if his replies came tardily a turn or two of the rollers which threatened to pull his joints from their sockets was considered necessary to extract from the sufferer any information desired in this place and in this way guy fox was racked after gunpowder plot and between the periods of torture was confined in a small cell called little ease which was constructed so skilfully that the captive could neither lie down nor stand up with any satisfaction but was compelled to exist there in a cramped and stooping posture this miserable cell lay between the dungeon containing the rack and the great dungeon under the crypt of st john's chapel though the formidable iron-studded door of little ease with its ingenious system of locks and bolts is still to be seen the cell itself has been broken through to give entrance to the black vault beyond yet even to-day in spite of foolish improvements some idea of the power of little ease to administer suffering can be gained in this at one time circumscribed space guy fox spent his last weeks with no fresh air to breathe and no glimmer of light to cheer the gloomy dungeon to which little ease now gives access under st john's crypt was the foulest and blackest of all the tower cells even now it is a place of horror though an attempt has been made to enlarge the single window high up on the eastern side and admit a little more light hundreds of jews were shut up here in king john's time charged as has already been stated in the previous chapter with tampering with the coinage of the realm no light of any kind entered the place in those days the earthen floor was carefully kept damp for greater inconvenience the air was poisonous and the place was at all times infested with rats 
this cell rivals in horror the black hole of calcutta and in it men were to use a meredithian expression chilled in subterranean sunlessness in the basement chambers to the west of this dungeon and of the torture chamber a well has within recent years been discovered together with a secret passage leading towards the moat and the river in connection with the discovery of this passage it is stated that a grated cell had been found in which the waters of the thames flowed and receded with the tide it is possible that some poor sufferer may have been put for a time in this place of horror but we may be thankful that as no details have survived time's ravages it is not necessary for us to demand definite information on the subject there are certain corners of tower history that are better left unexplored the dungeons of the white tower might conceivably have been left in something of their original state the modernization they have undergone has robbed them of all appearance of age they have the look with the exception of the jews dungeon of store cellars constructed last week utility has done its best to kill romance tower green beneath the western wall of the white tower there is massed together and now railed in a curious collection of old guns and mortars mostly trophies won from france spain and portugal some are early examples of english cannon found in the mary rose wrecked off spithead in fifteen forty five two solemn ravens hover about these old guns day by day and perch at times with significant gravity on the side of the block near by tower green was the place of private as tower hill was the place of public execution and was reserved for culprits of royal rank this open space in the centre of the buildings saw prisoners led from cell to cell saw many a headless body carried on rude stretcher to burial in st peter's and was the place of revels on far-off coronation eves when the king of the morrow was feasting in the keep above or in the palace it saw also the last sad moments of three queens of england in the far corner towards the bloody tower lay the constable's garden in which raleigh walked and in which the proud princess elizabeth had paced along the paths that her favourite of later days had been sent by the prouder queen to tread farther westward and marked by a sentry-box at the door is the king's house in which lives the present major of the tower it was from this house that lord nisdale escaped on the eve of his execution in seventeen sixteen his wife who had ridden in bitter wintry weather from scotland in order to make appeal to king george on her husband's behalf found only disappointment as a result of the appeal to royal clemency but she was not to be daunted by her rebuff at court though the attempt seemed quite a hopeless one she was determined to make all effort possible to save her lord from the scaffold from her lodgings in drury lane she walked to the tower accompanied by her landlady mrs mills and a friend mrs morgan mrs morgan consented to wear a dress belonging to mrs mills above her own dress and lady nithsdale proposed to get her husband away from the tower disguised in this extra dress when she reached the king's house she was allowed to take in with her only one friend at a time and so brought in mrs morgan who had she explained come to bid lord nithsdale farewell when the custodian of the prison room had retired lord nithsdale was hastily dressed in the spare set of female garments and mrs morgan was sent out to bring in her maid evans mrs mills came upstairs in answer to the call and held a handkerchief to her face as was natural wrote lady nithsdale when describing the events afterwards for a person going to take a last leave of a friend before execution i desired her to do this that my lord might go out in the same manner her eyebrows were inclined to be sandy and as my lord's were dark and thick i had prepared some paint to disguise him i had also got an artificial headdress of the same coloured hair as hers and rouged his face and cheeks to conceal his beard which he had not had time to shave all this provision i had before left in the tower i made mrs mills take off her own hood and put on that which i had brought for her i then took her by the hand and led her out of my lord's chamber 
in passing through the next room in which were several people with all the concern imaginable i said my dear mrs catherine go in all haste and send me my waiting-maid she certainly cannot reflect how late it is i am to present my petition to-night to-morrow it is too late hasten her as much as possible for i shall be on thorns till she comes when i had seen her safe out i returned to my lord and finished dressing him i had taken care that mrs mills did not go out crying as she came in that my lord might better pass for the lady who came in crying and afflicted and the more so that he had the same dress that she wore when i had almost finished dressing my lord i perceived it was growing dark and was afraid that the light of the candle might betray us so i resolved to set off i went out leading him by the hand whilst he held his handkerchief to his eyes i spoke to him in the most piteous and afflicted tone bewailing the negligence of my maid evans who had ruined me by her delay then i said my dear mrs betty run quickly and bring her with you i am almost distracted with this disappointment the guards opened the door and i went downstairs with him still conjuring him to make all possible dispatch as soon as he had cleared the door i made him walk before me for fear the sentinel should take notice of his walk at the bottom of the stairs i met my dear evans into whose hands i confided him lord nithsdale now safely out of the walls and on tower hill was hurried to a convenient lodging in the city lady nithsdale having sent her maid betty off returned to her lord's room and alone there pretended to converse with her husband imitating his voice so well that no suspicions were aroused she continues her narrative thus i then thought proper to make off also i opened the door and stood half at it that those in the outward chamber might hear what i said but held it so close that they could not look in i bade my lord a formal farewell for the night and added that something more than usual must have happened to make evans negligent on this important occasion who had always been so punctual in the smallest trifles that i saw no other remedy but to go in person that if the tower was then open when i had finished my business i would return that night but that he might be assured i would be with him as early in the morning as i could obtain admittance to the tower and i flattered myself i should bring more favourable news then before i shut the door i pulled through the string of the latch so that it could only be opened on the inside on her way out lady nithsdale told one of the servants that candles need not be taken in to his master until he sent for them and so left the king's house crossed tower green in the dusk of the evening and was soon safely in london streets lord nithsdale eventually escaped disguised as a footman in the suite of the venetian ambassador from dover lady nithsdale bravely returned to dumfrieshire and at great risk for the king was great incensed at the trick she had played recovered valuable papers buried in a garden there then joined her husband in rome by her splendid intrepidity she had saved her lord from the scaffold on the very eve of execution had baffled the king's emissaries and altogether gave king george cause to complain that she had given him more trouble than any other woman in the whole of europe beecham tower this tower lies in the centre of the western ballium wall and is entered at the foot of a flight of steps leading down from the level of the green a narrow winding stairway which is typical of the means of ingress and egress in all the lesser towers on the wall brings us to the large prison chamber of this tower the only portion shown to the public in tudor days the beecham tower was set aside especially as the place of detention of captives of high estate in the realm it is the least gloomy of the towers it must at all times have had a good supply of light if we may judge by the delicacy of the inscriptions and carvings that those imprisoned there have left upon its walls on entering the prison room an inscription bearing the word peveril will be seen on the wall to the left this caught the eye of sir walter scott when visiting the tower and suggested the title for the then unwritten novel the scenes of which are laid in the time of charles the second in that book a description is given in chapter forty of the king's visit to the fortress 
in the meantime the royal barge paused at the tower and accompanied by a laughing train of ladies and of courtiers the gay monarch made the echoes of the old prison towers ring with the unwonted sounds of mirth and revelry charles who often formed manly and sensible resolutions though he was too easily diverted from them by indolence or pleasure had some desire to make himself personally acquainted with the state of the military stores arms etc of which the tower was then as now the magazine the king accompanied by the dukes of buckingham ormond and one or two others walked through the well-known hall in the white tower in which is preserved the most splendid magazine of arms in the world and which though far from exhibiting its present extraordinary state of perfection was even then an arsenal worthy of the great nation to which it belonged in the same chapter the tower legend of the king's discovery of colby who had helped the king at worcester fight as a warder in the tower is told sir walter adds a footnote to the tale the affecting circumstances are i believe recorded in one of the little manuals which are put into the hands of visitors in this room of beecham tower nigel lord glenvarlock is imprisoned as narrated in the fortunes of nigel which pictures earlier days the times of james i nigel followed the lieutenant to the ancient buildings on the western side of the parade and adjoining to the chapel used in those days as a state prison but in ours this was written in eighteen twenty two as the mess-room of the officers of the guard upon duty at the fortress the double doors were unlocked the prisoner ascended a few steps followed by the lieutenant and a warder of the higher class they entered a large but irregular low-roofed and dark apartment exhibiting a very scanty proportion of furniture the lieutenant having made his reverence with the customary compliment that he trusted his lordship would not long remain under his guardianship took his leave nigel proceeded to amuse himself with the melancholy task of deciphering the names mottoes verses and hieroglyphics with which his predecessors in captivity had covered the walls of their prison-house there he saw the names of many forgotten sufferers mingled with others which will continue in remembrance until english history shall perish there were the pious effusions of the devout catholic poured forth on the eve of his sealing his profession at tyburn mingled with those of the firm protestant about to feed the fires of smithfield it was like the roll of the prophet a record of lamentation and mourning and yet not unmixed with brief interjections of resignation and sentences expressive of the firmest resolution there are ninety-one names on the walls of this room in the beecham tower and the earliest date fourteen sixty two is cut beside the name of talbot other notable inscriptions are those of the pole family number thirty three of which two members died in captivity here the dudley carving number fourteen consisting of a frame made up of a garland of roses geraniums honeysuckle and oak leaves within are a bear and lion supporting a ragged staff which is the dudley crest beneath is the name of the carver john dudley the eldest of five dudley brothers imprisoned in this chamber this john earl of warwick died here a prisoner the bailey inscription number seventeen dates from elizabeth's reign and was carved by charles bailey involved in plots to liberate mary queen of scots after her coming to england he has carved these words on the stone wise men ought circumspectly to see what they do to examine before they speak to prove before they take in hand to beware whose company they use and above all things to whom they trust the earl of arundel one of the devout catholics mentioned by scott died in this room after ten years imprisonment in the tower his inscription is in latin and dated june twenty second fifteen eighty seven the words may be translated the more suffering for christ in this world the more will be the glory with christ in the next thou hast crowned him with honour and glory o lord in memory everlasting he will be just another carving number twenty six of april twenty two fifteen fifty nine concludes thus there is an end of all things and the end of a thing is better than the beginning 
be wise and patient in trouble for wisdom defends thee as well as the money use well the time of prosperity and remember the time of misfortune this inscription bears some resemblance to another of bailey's number fifty one where he has recorded on his prison wall that the most unhappy man in the world is he that is not patient in adversities for men are not killed with the adversities they have but with the impatience which they suffer hope to the end and have patience if any were in need of patience and hope they were these poor prisoners in the beecham tower another captive t salmon in sixteen twenty two recorded that he had been kept close prisoner here eight months thirty two weeks two hundred and twenty four days five thousand three hundred and seventy six hours the husband of lady jane grey carved on these walls number eighty five the one word jane and this in its simplicity is the saddest of all the writings on the wall this tower which was restored by salvin in eighteen fifty four still retains an original edward the third window and much other ancient work its name is derived from the thomas beecham earl of warwick imprisoned towards the end of the fourteenth century during the time of the wyatt rebellion it appears to have been known as the cobham tower but that name did not adhere to it long it consists of three floors the main prison room being on the second story and possesses a battlemented roof in this tower a secret passage has been discovered in the wall where spies could hover and overhear the talk of prisoners to the north of it and opposite the chapel stands the chaplain's house and that portion of tower green immediately adjoining was at one period a burial ground for tower parishioners chapel of st peter ad vincula the crypt of the present chapel was built in the reign of henry the third all that stands above it is of the tudor period in eighteen sixty seven it received its last careful restoration but apart from its tragic associations it is not a very inspiring bit of ecclesiastical architecture there is a peculiar stiffness about the building and an oppressive gloom in the place that makes one regard it rather as a large tomb than as a church for living men and women to worship in strangely enough one has none of this feeling when visiting the chapel of st john in the white tower which is a place that never fails to lead the thoughts to another world than this in st peter's one is haunted by generations of spectres who have passed from life to death by violent means and one has also the fear that macaulay is lingering in some corner and moralizing on the pathos of it all under the pavement of this church as was discovered in the eighteen seventy six restoration the victims from the scaffold of royal blood or otherwise were very hastily and carelessly interred at no great depth the bones of queen anne boleyn were identified and now lie in front of the altar with those of queen catherine howard and the dukes of northumberland and somerset mr doyne bell describing the discovery of the remains of anne boleyn says the forehead and lower jaw were small and especially well formed the vertebrae were particularly small especially one joint which was that next to the skull and they bore witness to the queen's little neck the skeletons of the aged countess of salisbury and of the duke of monmouth were also found a list of the notable people buried in this church will be seen on the west wall near the door and here too are preserved portions of the leaden coffin lids of the scots lords who were the last victims of the block on tower hill several very interesting memorial of those famous in tower annals will be noticed on the east and south walls near the chancel the elaborate tomb to the left within the altar rails is erected in memory of sir richard blount and of sir michael his son both lieutenants of the tower in their time these blounts died in the middle of the sixteenth century in the body of the church sir thomas moore and bishop fisher protector somerset and thomas cromwell stafford and sir john elliot lie buried one of the earliest monuments in the building is that lying between the organ and chancel commemorating sir richard chumley and his wife elizabeth the recumbent figures are carved in alabaster neither the knight nor his lady was buried in the church 
sir richard held the position of lieutenant of the tower in henry the seventh's reign lord de ross the last deputy lieutenant of the tower and author of a valuable record of its history who died in eighteen seventy four has a memorial here it was owing to his care that the tombstone covering the grave of talbot edwards so nearly killed when defending the crown jewels at the time of the colonel blood onslaught was replaced this slab had been doing duty as a paving stone on tower green the communion plate of st peter's dates from the time of the first charles and the vessels bear the royal monogram c r with crown above they have been used by many a condemned captive just before the hour appointed for death End of chapter three part two